right? Um, so I guess we can't go over. Uh, it was a long chapter, I'm not gonna lie. Um, a lot of content to go through. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how this goes. Okay, um, evaluation. What is it? It's basically you know having the ability to evaluate a quoted expression in different environments. Uh, why do we do it? Tight evaluation. Um, we kind of want a standard approach to non-standard evaluation. And more specifically, uh, how functions interact with each other safely. That's what I'm going to cover today. Um, look at the basics of the evaluations, closure, data masking, um, tidy evaluation in practice, and maybe if we have time, uh, base evaluation. Okay. So eval takes two arguments, an expression and an environment, uh, usually a symbol or an expression. Um, so here you have X going in as an expression, 10, uh, different another Y, 2, 12, that makes sense, and an environment. So uh, n function creates a child of the current environment. Um, so we pass in an environment where x is a 1,000. Uh, so you express, you evaluate the expression x plus y, 1,000 plus 2 is 1,002. Um, so yeah, expression argument is evaluated. So in the first sentence there, first line of code, uh, print x plus 1 is evaluated. So it prints out 11 twice because at the end of eval, it returns you um, uh the result so you wrap it in an expression and there you have it 1001 okay um, hi, so John. in base art, um yeah i didn't get the previous one this one yeah yeah so print x plus one there in the first uh first line that is not wrapped in an expression so it's evaluated with the global environment not the environment that we pass in which was 11 before or 10, sorry. Okay. So yeah, right okay. there. Okay. But if you wrap it in an expression, it's not evaluated until we evaluate it. So uh, you use the right environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about the 1,000? 1,000 here. Um, no, the 1,000 in the first case, um, is it not say in the current environment as well? I don't think so. Can anyone else comment on this? I'm not 100%. Yeah, that's that's the part I'm a little confused on why it's why it printed twice. Uh, let's try. Because it's only printed eval print, but env. What is what do you what happens when you do env of of a variable? What is this cat? So cute. Okay. I posted it in the chat before. It's uh it's in our environment thing. Oh, yeah, I think I saw that. Okay. I like it how you load that eleven eleven. You don't need it. Maybe. Uh, Does it do anything if I do this? Can I? Can I go x? Yeah, x is ten here. Um, so I think this print x plus one uh, mm -hmm. by default when it gets evaluated prints eleven, and right. when you're at the end of the uh, evaluation, it also prints out an eleven. Not sure why it's ten though. Like I. Like why this doesn't get uh, passed on at all. I would expect like the second time, maybe it would be 1000, but. No, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sure not the second time because if you write print, it just gets evaluated to 11 and then you have eval 11 in your environment mm. with X is 1000. So you are not waiting for the expression. You are just putting 11 in there. Okay. Okay, that makes sense to me. That doesn't make sense to me. Oh. <laughs> I, I, so. so it doesn't matter. You can literally just put env x of whatever arbitrary or nothing, and it doesn't like uh, the, the, the problem is it gets straight evaluated the print comment because we know that uh, if 
that there are two functions actually here. And the inner function will be evaluated before the outer function. So what is happening here in the tree print will be evaluated to 11. And the 11 will be inside your eval. So it's not even uh, going ah. to the X, it's just 11. Like ah, it would be yeah. like this. 11 is also evaluated and it gives 11, right? I think so. I think this is what eventually comes yeah. out because this gets evaluated, yeah, exactly. which is yeah. 11. So it prints so it and then it evaluates yeah. 11. So it doesn't, so the end, the end argument so, is useless here? I think so. Yeah, and yes. you want, um, uh, what will happen if you evaluate this with 11? What will happen? Run it. Eval yeah. 11? Yes. Okay, do you guys know how to get out of this debug? <laughs> I'm, lo I'm lost here. Um, Try escape. I'm trying. Okay, I'll, um, whatever. I think it's Eval Q. 11. No. Q. No, no. Or Q with the, as a function. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we haven't done the okay. chapter on debugging yet no i guess not i saw the <laughs> cohort one do this cool debugging thing with um uh some of the base art functions and yeah what's another one um and this is all related and i just want to have a question and um, is it possible for instance now if i open a single art studio and i'm running a program can I run another program concurrently? Like I can run multiple instances on the single R studio. Is it possible? Single instances so. on what? Um, multiple instances of program, multiple instances of program in R studio. For instance, if I have, I, I, I am running a program um, I want to like run another one. I want because it's taking time. Can I un run another instance of the pro another program? I think it's as, as long as you're not in the same project. Oh, okay. It'll be yeah. isolated, but then you'll have two separate versions of Yeah, the but if it is the same project, you cannot run multiple yeah. scripts. Each, each instance of, the, of our studio has its own interpreter. And the unfortunate thing is that that also runs most of the R Studio stuff. So whenever you're you're stuck, you're stuck. I think. Yeah. I mean, if you are doing, uh, you you do some stuff in VS Code. In VS Code, you only must open a second terminal. Then you can run one thousand terminals with R Code. Right. It can send to multiple uh, multiple, you know, repos. Yeah. All right, um, let's get back to the content. Okay, so we're, we're, we're clear on this, right? The evaluation 11 is 11, so it gets printed out twice. Okay, local and source, we're just gonna quickly go over how these functions were implemented. Uh, start with local, it gives you a nice little wrapper around when you create something, it doesn't, uh, you can't access it at the end of it. So you go X and Y at their own values, X plus Y, you try and access them from the outside, it's not there. So how do we implement this? It's two things. We capture the expression, and then you create a new environment, and you evaluate the expression in there. And uh, lexical scoping prevents the environments from interacting with each other, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, so you define an environment uh, using the caller environment. So remember, that's a child of the caller, so that's the global. Um, and then you turn the expression into an expression using an expr, uh, and then you evaluate it. So pretty simple. and think this works. Um, so yeah, that's local. And then source is you uh, read in a file and then evaluate it in your environment. So uh, well, let's say you have a line of code here. I actually have a function here, right? Pretty simple function. If you want to import it, uh, you read in the files. Actually, let's do it.
work. All right. So this is my path. Uh, this is my environment, global. Uh, that's a file, right? That's the this um, in uh, parse format, I believe, like with the new line. Um, where were we? And then the expression, you use the parse expr function to kind of capture everything, which looks like this. It's in a list. Uh, and this is a this is an expression. Uh, then the reason you do this, res null, invisible res, you want to return something at the end. So the last thing is not a for loop at the end of the function. So you go through the expression, in this case, just one, and then you evaluate them in the environment that we created, which is the global, uh, child of the global, right? Bang. And then it's loaded in my uh, current environment. Does that make sense? Yep, just uh, you, you said, that's nothing to do with that, but you said with the for loop gets returned. What is actual return? Just the for function or the for loop and all the in, in what's inside? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just read this in the, I just watched yeah. the first cohort and then the, that's what they said about this rest comment. Yeah, I, I think it's cool, but I, I just wanted to know what's, what's returned if it, only the for function or if it's the for loop with all the uh, what's inside. Oh, do you want to try? Yeah. Hold on, I got to. Oh, it's there. I, I, I think uh, you want to capture the source two in a variable. Like here. Yeah. I think that worked. Oh, was that not? Uh, it it oh, works, okay. that's null. Okay. Hmm. What was it before? It was, did we do anything? Actually, let's try. Did you rerun source two? It's not. I think so. No. Oh no. Okay. It wasn't all before. It is a function now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. So if oh. you don't return anything at the end, it just gives you a null. But if you actually do return something, even if it's a null, it uh, is a function. That sounds strange. I think it's something that you didn't uh, want it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. May maybe it's a problem because you're still having the debugger one, but I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, sorry for my uh, novice debugging. Okay. Um, so yeah, I did a couple of exercises. This is pretty easy. Expression and evaluation pretty much cancel each other. So this gets carried away if it's... Uh, uh, even numbers, there's going to be four, four, and then this doesn't do anything because you're evaluating on an evaluating. Yeah. Um, another exercise, get function, it searches an object by its name. So pretty simple, you pass in a string, you capture it as a symbol, and then you uh, evaluate the symbol using the environment that's passed in. Okay, closure. Um, it's a combination of coding and closure uh, in a sense that you're coding the expression and enclosing the environment all in one packet. Uh, so we'll cover the five things, creating them, evaluating them, dot, dot, dot arguments under the hood and why it's similar to a formula. Uh, and then you nest them at the end. 
uh, three ways of creating them. Uh, the book recommends the first one only. Um, it's a end quote and end quotes function that takes uh, uh, just the expression. And I think the global is uh, maybe passed in in the current environment. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to pass in the environment explicitly, you can do it with a new closure. Um, hi, um, John. Yep. So can you go back? So, so all these three ways they are used for creating for closures, right? Um, yep. Yeah. So what's the difference between this second one, anchor, anchors, and core and cores? Um, are they, they do they have any difference? Because I know this new core just he said they are used for like um, uh, some uh, experimental purpose. Um, what about what is there any difference between these two? I don't know actually. The book said this is an equivalent of an expra and express function, and similar to how this is an in expra and in express, but not 100% beyond that. Okay. So the quo quo is outside the functions and end quo is inside the functions because uh -huh. if, we, if, if you would use in your first example quo of x, mm -hmm. it would try to capture x on, and not your expression. Okay. So it, the end, end quo awaits an, um, a user input. Okay. So end quo and end quo is for to capture in, uh, user input, right? Yeah, or in functions. So yeah, yeah. In function, yeah. Okay, but code just to capture expression. Ah, okay, like the extra and extended expression. Okay, I remember. I gotcha. All right. Uh, here comes eval tidy. Takes a single closure. Uh, so you pass in a new closure that we create. The expression is x plus y, and it is this. Uh, and then eval tidy it gives you 11 rather than doing eval, uh, you know, this explicitly with an eval function. Okay, dot, dot, dot. This was a little confusing, um, but you can pass in uh, a lot of different stuff into the dot, dot, dot argument. For example, uh, we're output is we're creating a list of two quotas and we're doing it by calling G function inside the F. Um, so we define X outside as zero and we're going to call the function f, which is, uh, and then we're going to pass in this expression, global uh, equals x, which gets passed into the dot, dot, dot. And uh, so this comes here, and that goes there. And then we're going to pass in another argument, f is x, into the g function with this x created in the f, uh, which just enclosures everything. So the output is um, global from here, uh, with the x, in the environment, global environment, and then the F argument that we passed in uh, is here with its own environment. And then, yeah, you can map double them uh, uh, and then evaluate them in their own uh, in their own environment. Um, did you try that example with the in an expression? Then it don't work out. Sorry, what was the question? Did you try that that thing with n expression? So with the not with the closure with the expression, then it won't work. Huh? That's 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 uh, the maybe. catch. Huh? It it just have to be the environment, right? You're not specifying the environment specifically. Right? Uh, yeah, so yeah. Because I think with n expression, it always takes the caller environment, so x would be yeah. zero. But I'm not sure. But I. I think that's that's the catch why you should here use a closure. The closure. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I'm just going to move on quickly because I've got a lot of stuff to cover. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it took me 30 minutes, so um, we'll see. Uh, closure under the hood, it's a formula. So it, uh, uh, formulas capture the environment in an attribute. So you can access them like so. Same with the closure. If you actually look at the uh, class of a closure, it's a subclass, sub, subclass, yeah, subclass of, uh, of a formula. Um, thankfully, we have some uh, helper functions. So we can do get expression of a closure and then get environment of a closure, which is really nice. Uh, now you can nest them, uh, meaning the, you can unquote a closure 
and use them in an expression. So remember our closures were these guys. Um, that's one, that's two. And if you unquote them, it just looks like their expression. Uh, their, uh, what do you call this, tilde carries away. And apparently the book didn't like it. So it gives you a nice function xprint and turns it into a hat. I don't know why that's bad. Does anyone, does anyone know? Okay. Um, quick exercise, uh, closures can be passed around like we just looked at. Um, so we're gonna create a closure, q1, uh, x is one. So this unquoted is one. So that's, that gets passed around here. And then this x gets evaluated with this environment. So we pretty much got 10 plus one, which is q2. And then you pass that into the next closure, uh, 11. Uh, and then this x is of course evaluated using this environment. So the end result, you get 111 if you add them on. Data mask. Data mask is an environment containing user supplied objects. Uh, objects in the data, uh, object in the mask, have precedence over objects in the environment. So, this is uh, really useful when you don't want your environment and data to be messing with each other. Uh, we'll see an uh, example later, but um, you can pass into a closure, um, oh, sorry, eval tidy, another data frame to evaluate using your closure. So here we create a data frame, one to 10, uh, closure, and you just give it a random expression, x plus uh, x times y. Um, and then you evaluate this closure onto this DF. Uh, so you find the y here uh, and then multiply by x. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, 10, whatever, times 100 uh, x here. Uh, you can do a wrapper. Um, so you don't have to work with a closure. You can pass in the data and expression. Uh, you make it into a closure, and then you just evaluate them at the end. Uh, you can also use a list instead of a data frame. I think, which I think the book covers at the end. Um, so there are pronouns um, in this case here. Like it's really tough to see where whether the x will come from the environment or if there's another column in DDF called x. Uh, to uh, offset this, we have a nice pronoun. Dot data uh, dollar x will always refer to the data frame. Then dot env will always refer to the environment that's passed in. Uh, so here we're going to look data x, which is uh, the column that has one through ten. Um, and then in here we're going to use the environment x, which is actually just one integer one. Uh, so we, you return one. It has three applications that the book covered. Um, subset, transform, and the select argument of the subset function. Okay, let's look at subset first. Um, it's basically uh, it's basically a filter, selecting certain rows of a data frame based on what you evaluate. Um, so to elaborate this, we have a data frame, um, right? Um, it's subset, uh, sample df, and an expression. This is the same thing as writing this, which is a lot longer. Um, B equals C, um, whatever, whatever, B equals C. Uh, what did they do? They took a data frame and an expression, evaluate the expression using the data, data frame as a mask, and then use the results to subset the data frame. Quasure, turn, turn the uh, argument into a quasure, sorry, expression into a quasure, uh, and then you evaluate the sample DF using the quasure, uh, quasure. Uh, do a little check, and then what this returns is a is a logical vector, if I remember correctly. And then you use that to uh, subset the data frame using the square bracket. So that's subset. Um, is this is this how filter is implemented in study in deploy? I think so. A lot of the select like uh, starts with, ends with, contains that kind of stuff. That they, uh, they do their own data masking. If I if I remember correctly. I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but I yeah. think so. 
That's my yeah, explanation. Because, like I was thinking, um, I don't know, I'm just showing how um, how to do that. So I was thinking this is how um, they are implementing it also in the flyer. I mean, the filter and deep is a lot, lot longer. So it's not that easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, transform, that's basically mutate in tidyverse. Uh, add new variables to the data frame using the existing ones. Um, so a data frame, and then we want, to we want to turn the column X into its negative, and we want to make a new column Y2 uh, by multiplying two to Y. And then as you would expect, it kind of looks like this. Uh, so here we use a dot, dot, dot arguments. Uh, so dot, dot, dot being the new columns that we want to modify or create. Um, and then we're going to pass them into the dot, 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 capture them as closures, uh, and then evaluate every single one of the closures, in, in our case, uh, two. So uh, there's a data frame. And here's the expressions that we want. And these are going to be passed in as dot, 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 this guy and this guy. Uh, we enclosure them using the enclose. Um, then you loop along it, or sorry, iterate over it, and you get the name which is uh, X2. Yeah, this, I think. And then in the actual dots, you have this. Mm -hmm. And then you evaluate, uh, and then you add the new column into data using the data mask. Okay. Um, and then you evaluate the expression uh, onto the data. And that's a new column. Okay, yeah, that's it. And then you return the result at the end. Pretty um, confusing. What? Oh, okay, okay, the data. Sorry, what? Yeah, I got you. Okay, that's good. Um, here's the select argument in subset. Um, so this allows you to refer to variables as if they were numbers. So here we can say, subset the DF using BD as the index, if that makes sense. So A got skipped and E got skipped because they weren't in this range. It's a named list. Um, so what they did was they make a list like this where every item has a column name, A, B, C, D, and then they have the index number, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then you can use this to subset this, which is implemented like so, uh, so what do we do here? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass in B through D as the dot dot dot. Uh, you loop over it to uh, grab the name, which is B C D, uh, set it as a name, and then you uh, index the you sorry you assign the index numbers so to seek along into the um, the value, and then you use that to uh, map onto the data frame. I think that's how it works. Let me know if I said anything wrong. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't one hundred percent on this select argument. Yeah, it's because you have to note that p to d will generate you a vector of integer numbers of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And that's why the map works. So you, if you write in the console B to D, uh, you can just show it, then, then you will get a vector normally. Yeah, okay. O only write P, to, yeah, only write, yeah, only this, you don't need more. Pardon? Yeah, use only this B and the double pointy thing and the D. Just write it in the console and you will see the output. Like this. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It maybe maybe this. That works. 
What if I did? I can pass an opposure here, right? Uh, or no? So at least in the console, I can simply write A to C or something. I don't know why it's not working for you. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but the idea is the named list, right? Like you have a, a index number for these uh, column names, and then you use them to subset. Yeah, you have to quote them in bracket notation, right? Oh, when you're doing uh, just one square square bracket? Well, yeah, like in, in, in what Hannes was just doing, um, if, I don't know, but it won't work with a range. If you did, you know, DF comma quote B end quote, then it would, should give you column B, right? So. Yeah, but what I do not understand is when, when I write uh, A to C or something, it gives me an integer vector from one to three. And I don't know why it's not which one working. Maybe my console is different. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have like data table loaded or something? Although no, oh. that only works on data tables. Oh, because I, I get something like this when I, when I do it. But we all already figured out that my console is a little bit different. <laughs> Well, so Hannes, that means you must have A as an object in your console. So if you just do A, it'll, you know, or, or type of A or something like that, it should tell you what it is. Either that or your console is somehow doing non-standard evaluation. I try reloading the console, maybe that helps. Do you want to share in the chat what you? Yeah, you're, you're right. Now, now I reloaded it. Maybe it's a package or something because I played the one. Oh yeah, this is an expression, right? Well, when I do this, this is a non-standard evaluation. Where's the same argument? Sorry. No, that's standard evaluation because if you do ls on the command line, it'll give you a list of of, uh, of objects in your console in your in your global environment. All right. Okay, uh, so wrapping up, um, there are three scenarios we have to think about tidy evaluation. Um, it's quoting and unquoting, handling ambiguity, which is pretty much a data mask, and then both. I wasn't too sure on the both part, but I'll try my best to explain them. So firstly, in the quoting and unquoting sense, uh, consider this function that resembles a data frame with replacement, basically bootstrap. Um, so it samples a bunch of index numbers from a data frame n times. Uh, and then you subset it, I guess, uh, using the uh, square bracket. Um, so we want to create a new function that allows us to resample and subset in a single step using like some kind of a some kind of a new valuation. And this doesn't work if if you're trying to do pass in a condition like an expression onto the condition. Onto the, onto the data frame, you use the subset two function that we created, uh, which is this. Um, you would expect uh, some kind of a data frame result at the end. And then when you try to uh, resample it, it doesn't work because it can't find the X. That's because it, the subsample function didn't quote any arguments. So it kind of evaluates right away, like we saw with the print X plus one and then runs into an error if you try to find an X. 
So what you do is you turn them into a quotient instead. So what was before this, this con here is now gonna get uh, enquotured and we're gonna unquote them uh, when we pass it on to the subset two function. And then when we try and resample it again, it works because it does find the X. Pretty confusing. Um, but apparently this works too, the double squiggly uh, brackets without doing the whole enclosure and unquoting. I don't know what this does, didn't really look into it. Um, I think Brett was talking about this a couple weeks ago, but. Yeah. My, my limited understanding is that it does uh, enquo and uh, bang bang in one step. Um, which doesn't seem to make sense because like my, my mental image of uh, Enquo and Bang Bang is that they're kind of the opposite of each other, but they're, they're not really. Yeah. That did not clear anything up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically skipping these two steps. Um, I don't know why you would do this. Like I like having this explicitly written out so I can follow what's going on. Yeah, they're they're, they're, rec they're recommending just... the the um the, the double curly now, but yeah. I don't know why because it's you know it's more explicit when you do it the way on the left. Um, and there was another thing that popped up on the um on the Slack about if you want to test your if you, like so let's say you want to test that the that the condition that's being passed in here is actually a condition. Um, if you test it in the wrong if you test it with the the uh, function on the right. Like if you put in something uh, above the DF, above the assignment to DF, that tests whether cond is a uh, um, is a you know however you want to test that it's a condition, um, then it won't work anymore. And I need to go back to the, the Slack to remember why. I'll, I'll dig it up and post it into the chat. But it was really it was an interesting discussion of like when stuff gets evaluated because because by testing it you're forcing evaluation, and then it's no longer something that can be end quoted in the same way that, uh, um, you know, so it'd be like the same thing as putting it before the uh, assignment to cond in the left-hand function, uh, the enquo. Um, I'll, I'll dig that up and post it in. I may be explaining it not quite right. Yeah, so um, this, um, what you're saying, I think even from um, what I shared um, programming with this layer, um, so they are not using this bang bang, they are now using this, uh, Curry bracket, double curry bracket. And they are basically the same. I mean, even in the programming with the player, they don't mention this double bang bang. They are just using uh, what is there. I have kind of a deja vu. Didn't we have that conversation last time or two, two weeks ago? I think so, when we're doing big picture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's using tidy valuation in a quoting and unquoting sense. Next is ambiguity, which is basically a data mask. And uh, yeah, think of this wrapper around the subset two function. We're going to pass in a data, uh, some kind of a value, and we're going to uh, turn that into an expression using this X, which can go wrong in two cases when exists in the calling environment, but not in the DF. So this data frame doesn't have a column named X. So when we try to find an X in the, uh, um, the data frame is not there. Uh, or when the val exists as a column in DF, right? So what this does is uh, the val two gets, sorry, hold on. Yeah, okay, so that, that what this is doing in this function is basically using the DF and they're comparing these two columns, right? When X is greater than val, which is never, uh, it pops up. So we use the data, uh, data mask pronouns to uh, avoid the situation. And when you do this, uh, when you call the dot env pronoun, you can typically unquote them using the bang bang. But I guess you can do it with a curly curly, or is, am I wrong there? I 
I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it won't work because it, it doesn't have to be in, in, in quoted first. Try it. Yeah. The word research into the curly curly. Um, the meta programming shelter is really confusing with many um, terms <laughs> and new vocabulary. If I do, probably, probably shouldn't work. Yeah, okay. Wait. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to carry away with this. Um, yeah, so and the last thing we talk about is the quasi-quotation and ambiguity on the same scenario. I didn't really get this. Um, so we have a threshold var function, which lets the user pick which column that we want to subset from rather than saying x here. And this kind of gets over my head a little bit from here. Uh, so we're passing in a var as a string. Um, uh, we turn them into a symbol and actually, sorry, we pass in an expression, I guess, turn it into a symbol. Uh, as a string, and we use that string to uh, select the column of the data that we uh, evaluate against some kind of a value. I don't know why this is both quasi quotation and ambiguity, because we have to do this, maybe. Isn't that here uh, somehow the problem is if var is not defined or something like this, it will look in the global environment. That's why it's called ambiguity. If val is not, okay. I mean, it probably throws you an error because var is not defined. But, uh, But for example, if you would write a uh, double bang and some global uh, variable here, like X or something, it will okay. look for the global one, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay, because this, um, no, hold on, what am I trying to say? Yeah, because if this val was a column in the DF that would throw, this at you, uh, the one we just looked at. Uh, where, where is it? Yeah, this here. Yeah. Uh, so that's ambiguity, and it's quasi quotation because we're doing this. We pass in an X, that's an argument, I guess. Uh, we turn that into a symbol, string, and we use that to subset, or sorry, select the column. Is that why it's quasi quotation? Uh, yeah, but here, I mean, you're catching no, you're generating a symbol and then you are creating a string. That's why the double bracket is here because you're simply using it, would be the same if you call threshold var with it x as a string and then ignoring all of the n, n symbol thing. Okay. Yeah, and I guess you turned it into a closure if you wanted to work both ways and then unquote it, uh, the expression, and then unquote the value. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Um, that's all I wanted to cover. Do you guys want to cover base evaluation? I have, I have the, I have the content, but what do you guys think? This felt pretty yeah. irrelevant to me, this chapter, or sorry, this section. I kind of want to say that I'm already confused enough. <laughs> <laughs> so they are more or less um, uh, what, uh, what we have covered about implementation in this, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. We looked at the tidy way and uh, last section of this chapter covers base, oh. which was super confusing, not, not gonna lie. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, the whole chapter is so confusing. Yeah, it was a tough chapter. It took me a long time to understand. Ah, okay. Um, Hannes shared something about the card operator. Mm. That's from the official documentation. But I think exactly the same thing I already shared in the last discussion. <laughs> Uh, Chivan, had you by any chance uh, look what I posted at Slack with the with the uh, de deconstructor thing? Sorry, in the Slack? Oh. Yeah, in our Slack group. I posted the, the thing with the deconstructing, which last time you tried and you said it does work. Now, uh, above, above. Oh, here. Yeah, last time you 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 something said like that's the same for you, I think. Um, yeah, I think so. When I do it, I get two different results, and I want to know if if it's still the same for you. Maybe we were talking about our bind, uh, but I'll try. Oh, no. Okay. So, yeah, that could be. But does R bind even work with the list? With the list? Is that what you said? Yeah, R bind X, X, Y. Did I do something wrong? Do it only yeah, with the list. I, I think it doesn't even does the list thing. Yeah, I don't know. Guess not. Yeah. With our point. No. no, our point is I think it doesn't work like this. But that's that's a good example for when do you could use a deconstructor actually. Because in the last last time we had a discussion uh, with bind rows in the list. Okay, well that's all I have for you guys. Yeah, I put it in the chat, but I think that's I I was definitely getting my my description of curly curly a little bit wrong. It uh, it forces the argument. It doesn't quote it. It doesn't enclose it. Um, so that's what that's what's happening with the function argument. So it's forcing the function argument and then um, then diffusing it. That makes more sense to me. I think. What does that mean? Sorry, couldn't follow you. <laughs> So I, I may be yet again getting it wrong, but I was thinking of it as, uh, you know, and quoting it and then, um, sorry, I'm getting my terminology wrong again. Um, so I think what it's doing is it's forcing the argument, so therefore evaluating it um, so that it's no longer a lazy argument, which is the whole problem with uh, um, using, um, what was it, and, uh, quote, um, instead of in quotes, um, and then immediately, um, immediately 
um, essentially doing bang bang to it. So I'm still, I think I'm still missing a couple of pieces, but I think that makes a little more sense because it's like, you know, if you're if you're trying to work on a, a lazy function argument, it's not going to really mean anything until it's evaluated. It's just a promise. Whereas in order to actually use it in your code, you know, to, to find a variable in a data frame, for instance, you need to you need to force it. So that's that's what it's doing first. So it's you know forcing the evaluation of that ex expression, and then it's um, doing whatever bang bang does, which was the topic of this chapter, which I'm apparently not clear on. <laughs> but isn't that exactly what bang bang does? It forces the expression. Yeah, I think it is it is doing exactly what bang bang is doing. Well, so what part is, is Curly doing that Bang Bang's not then? I, I think they are the same. Like you said, it's just a shorthand for end quote and Bang Bang. Well, right, but, uh, but Bang Bang doesn't work without the end quotes or end quote. Yeah. yeah. I think that Curly enforces it in, in, with quotation. But that's what Bang Bang does, though. No? I find it, I don't know, really? I find it hard to believe that they would make two things do the exact same thing. What's the point of having bang bang and curly? So, okay, so you're, so you're passing a variable name in as an argument. Um, all, all that is is an unevaluated expression until you do something with it. So then, okay, so that's what you've got. So when you're in, in quoting it, you're forcing evaluation of it with its environment. And then what, so then, all right, so then what does bang bang do? And now I'm, I'm confused when Leila says, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna stop talking because <laughs> maybe it works. <laughs> Hold on, I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> um, because I will, I mean, if you look at the programming with deploy, um, I think uh, which the recommend is the updated, I mean, uh, reference for uh, Tidyval. They are not using the bang bang, but they are using this double stuff. So I was thinking this is replacement um, instead of for using double bang bang. This is more tidy way. I don't know because it's doing exactly the same thing if you look at it in the, the way bang bang is working as we see it here in yeah so And Brett, I, 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 what do you mean? What, what is the meaning of promise? I, I think you are saying it is a promise. I don't know what is promise. Well, so, um, well, so like in an earlier chapter, when, when we saw, um, I'm trying to remember what the function was now, but when we saw arguments being passed in, um, if you if you try to evaluate them, it doesn't work right because it's just returning the argument because it's oh. it's lazy. Okay. Um, so you need to actually like force it and then evaluate it, mm, which I guess, okay. I mean, I don't understand why evaluation doesn't force something. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I feel like I'm, I don't want to confuse anybody anymore. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm missing a step here, I think. And I, I like where Hannes is going with this. Yeah, I think they had the same, right, Hannes? That's crazy. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, so now one, one thing to, so those two those two things that you wrote are are they do the same thing? Are the I, things I that you think, are writing on us? I I think so, and I I would say you can always um,
So this, you don't need to encore and bang, 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 bang. Um, <laughs> you just use one save and capture. Okay, yeah. yeah, so they're both doing the same thing. So now um, to make it to make it trickier, if you test whether var is a is I don't know whatever you want to test for it. Um, in the example we were talking about on the Slack a couple of weeks ago, it was uh, you know just testing whether it was null, like whether whether somebody actually passed something in. So if you put that if you put that test into both of these, if you put it um, right after the function definition, I don't think it'll work in either of them. Or I, I think you definitely need to use is null. Huh. And you want this now to double bang bang or? Uh... Well, just uh, no, just just try it like it is. So that, that makes sense. That's how you'd normally look at, at you know, you'd normally like check a, a function argument, right? But it's going to give you an error. No, and it's actually, an error that I don't really understand. Oh, it actually did, it, it printed it out, but then it gave an error for the rest of the, of the function. So that test worked, but then the rest of the function no longer did. But now if you move, um, I'm trying to remember how this works. Try, try moving that if statement below end quo. So I mean, should, shouldn't you do an error? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could do a stop if, if not, but what, the way yeah. you're doing it is fine. If we're just testing what happens when you look at var before you unquote it. Yeah, so it gives you already an error. Okay. And I think you'll get the same error down below. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, but it, sure, I get, no, I saw no, I don't get the same error. Oops, sorry. So. Okay, so yeah. one is, they're both giving the error. One is actually um, evaluating your if statement. No, nah, bo both. So this one is already here breaking because that's already drawing an error. Okay. Well, wait, but then why is, why is that erroring? Because you don't, do the if statement until after the end quo. I think no, no. that var is, I think it's because var is no longer null. I think if you, if you look at the, if you like print var um, after you, oh. it, so even though That's you're passing null now. into it, it's no longer, it's no longer just a null. It's now a, uh, um, it's now an, it's now a, whatever the an, a type of an enclosure is. Language. Yeah. So it's no longer null. That's why we're not getting the printing. But then why is the rest of the of the function failing? So uh, it's, because it's, this one, this one, um, the left hand side of blah 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 must be a string or a symbol. So probably if I remove this, yeah, I, I get I get the result, but. Okay. Um, Yeah, and I, I think that we were like in that Slack thing where there was also something about uh, um, Erlang including special test functions for enclosures because you can't yeah. test them the same way that you, yeah. And there was a whole chapter about null, I think, or whole uh, thing. I think I jumped it, I had it. I was like, no, we don't talk about it. But the, I mean, the, the thing here is that like if you if you evaluate var before you uh, end quo it, then you get into trouble because it's no it's no longer what end quo is expecting as a as a argument with an environment. It's now a you know so once you evaluate var, it's actually a you know um, again language. What, what's it called when you evaluated something and it exists? It's no longer a promise. Mm, language, so it does exist. 
only he can't work with null. Okay. It evaluates null and we get an error because he don't likes if here it says null. Uh, okay, because you can't have a null name for something. Okay. You, you can't okay. assign something to null, in other words. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'm still not sure if I'm getting my my map of what's going on here, right? Yeah, but but, but our discussion and that's probably important for us as users is that curly curly is probably the same as this one. Yeah, for like any as long as you're not doing any any testing or anything like that, curly curly is the same and it's probably easier and it might not be as explicit. Yeah, because I also think it's more. Uh, nicer to read, actually, because all of yeah. my code is looking like this at the moment. Mm. So you said we are not being testing. What do you mean by testing? Oh, just the the if statement that we were putting in there. Ah, okay. Um, so by running that, it would be the same as just saying like you you could do the same thing by saying force bar. Um, mm. So like if you put force bar there, then it's gonna you don't even need to have any, you know, anything happen mm. to var, but if it's forced, then it's evaluated so you can no longer unquote it. Okay. So if you need to do tests, the solution is to unquote it, do your tests, and then use it with bang bang. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm. I'm trying to decide whether this adds anything to my understanding of what's going on or not, but um, I mean, you could try to write tests with this. There's I'm trying to know what the, the functions are. There's some stuff in our line that's that's made for testing enclosures. Uh, we might have talked about it. It might be in. Um, yeah, I think Jun C has it in his his uh, his blog post. I mean, again, like I'm. This might be kind of esoteric rather than actually making this more understandable. Yeah. Um. So I think um the next chapter is. Um, translating our code and, and Layla has signed up, right? Layla. And, but we have the next, after Layla, we have uh, on a claim okay. chapter, debugging. Um, so. Oh yeah, next week. Oh yeah, translating. Yeah, next week, translating our code. Are you, yeah, your name there, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Oh, today we have gone nine forty. Yeah, forty minutes. Yeah, I think thanks, John, and uh, thank you all for the contribution. And Greg, and Ahmed, and uh, so we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. See everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys. Bye.